Jewish eschatology is the area of theology and philosophy concerned with events that will happen in the end of days and related concepts, according to the Hebrew Bible and Jewish thought. This includes the ingathering of the exiled diaspora, the coming of a Jewish Messiah, afterlife, and the revival of the dead Zodokim. In Judaism, end times are usually called the end of days. Aharet Hayumim, Hurat Haimim, a phrase that appears several times in the Tanakh. Until the late modern era, the standard Jewish belief was that after one dies, one's immortal soul joins God in the world to come while one's body decomposes. At the end of days, God will recompose one's body, place within it one's immortal soul, and that person will stand before God in judgment. The idea of a messianic age has a prominent place in Jewish thought, and is incorporated as part of the end of days. Jewish philosophers from medieval times to the present day have emphasized the soul's immortality and de-emphasized the resurrection of the dead. Topic. Overview and textual sources Topic. In Judaism, the main textual source for the belief in the end of days and accompanying events is the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible. In the five books of Moses the Torah, references are made in Deuteronomy chapters 28-31, that the Jews will not be able to keep the laws of Moses in the land of Israel and will be subsequently exiled but ultimately redeemed. The books of the Hebrew prophets elaborated and prophesied about the end of days. The ninth king is King Messiah, who, in the future, will rule from one end of the world to the other, as it is said, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea Ps. LXXII. 8, and another scripture text says, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth Dan, e. 35. The tenth king will restore the sovereignty to its owners. He who was the first king will be the last king, as it is said, Thus saith the Lord, the king. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God Isa, XLIV. 6, and it is written, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth Zek, XIV. 9. In rabbinic literature, the rabbis elaborated and explained the prophecies that were found in the Hebrew Bible along with the oral law and rabbinic traditions about its meaning. The main tenets of Jewish eschatology are the following, in no particular order, elaborated in the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. End of world before everything as follows. God redeems Israel, i.e., the Jewish people, from the captivity that began during the Babylonian exile, in a new Exodus. God returns the Jewish people to the land of Israel. God restores the house of David and the temple in Jerusalem. God creates a regent from the house of David, i.e. the Jewish Messiah, to lead the Jewish people and the world and usher in an age of justice and peace. All nations recognize that the God of Israel is the only true God. God resurrects the dead. God creates a new heaven and a new earth It is also believed that history will complete itself and the ultimate destination will be reached when all mankind returns to the Garden of Eden. Topic. Jewish Messianism Topic. The Hebrew word Mashiach or Moshiach refers to the Jewish idea of the Messiah. Mashiach means anointed, a meaning preserved in the English word derived from it, Messiah. The Messiah is to be a human leader, physically descended from the Davidic line, who will rule and unite the people of Israel and will usher in the messianic age of global and universal peace. While the name of Jewish Messiah is considered to be one of the things that precede creation, he is not considered divine, in contrast to Christianity where Jesus is both divine and the Messiah. In biblical times the title Mashiach was awarded to someone in a high position of nobility and greatness. For example, Kohen HaMessiah means high priest. In the Talmudic era the title Mashiach or Milkham Z, Malay HaMessiah in the Tiberian vocalization is pronounced Malik Hamasa and literally means the anointed king. It is a reference to the Jewish leader and king that will redeem Israel in the end of days and usher in a messianic era of peace and prosperity for both the living and deceased. Topic. Interpretations from the Tanakh Hebrew Bible. Topic. Most textual requirements concerning the Messiah and his reign are inferred from verses in the book of Isaiah, although aspects are mentioned in other prophets as well. The Sanhedrin will be re-established Isaiah chapter 1 verse 26 
Once he is king, leaders of other nations will look to him for guidance. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4. The whole world will worship the one God of Israel. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 17. He will be descended from King David. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 via King Solomon. 1 Chron 22 to 8 minus 10. The Messiah will be a man of this world, an observant Jew with fear of God. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2. Evil and tyranny will not be able to stand before his leadership. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 4. Knowledge of God will fill the world. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9. He will include and attract people from all cultures and nations. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10. All Israelites will be returned to their homeland. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 12. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 6. Death will be swallowed up forever. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8. There will be no more hunger or illness, and death will cease. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8. The dead will rise again. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19. The house of David shall be as God. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 8. God will seek to destroy all the nations that go against Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 9. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 12. Israel and Judah will be made into one nation again. Zechariah chapter 11 verses 12 to 14. Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 16 to 22. The Jewish people will experience eternal joy and gladness. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 11. He will be a messenger of peace. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7. Nations will recognize the wrongs they did Israel. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 minus 53 to 5. The peoples of the world will turn to the Jews for spiritual guidance. Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23. The ruined cities of Israel will be restored. Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 55. Weapons of war will be destroyed. Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 9. The temple will be rebuilt. Ezekiel chapter 40, resuming many of the suspended mitzvah commandments. He will then perfect the entire world to serve God together. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. He will take the barren land and make it abundant and fruitful. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 3, Amos chapter 9 verses 13 to 15, Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 29 to 30, Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 to 9. Topic. Talmud. Topic. The Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Sanhedrin, contains a long discussion of the events leading to the coming of the Messiah, for example, R. Johanan said, When you see a generation ever dwindling, hope for him, the Messiah, as it is written, and the afflicted people thou wilt save. R. Johanan said, When thou seest a generation overwhelmed by many troubles as by a river, await him, as it is written, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, which is followed by, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion. R. Johanan also said, The Son of David will come only in a generation that is either altogether righteous or altogether wicked. In a generation that is altogether righteous. As it is written, Thy people also shall be all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, or altogether wicked. As it is written, and he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor, 31 and it is elsewhere written, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. Throughout Jewish history Jews have compared these passages and others to contemporary events in search of signs of the Messiah's imminent arrival, continuing into present times. The Talmud tells many stories about the Messiah, some of which represent famous Talmudic rabbis as receiving personal visitations from Elijah the prophet and the Messiah. For example, R. Joshua b. Levi met Elijah standing by the entrance of R. Simeon b. Yohai's tomb. He asked him, Have I a portion in the world to come? He replied, If this master desires it. R. Joshua b. Levi said, I saw two, but heard the voice of a third. He then asked him, When will the Messiah come? Go and ask him himself, was his reply. Single quote. Where is he sitting? At the entrance. And by what sign may I recognize him? He is sitting among the poor lepers, all of them untie them all at once, and rebandage them together, whereas he unties and rebandages each separately, before treating the next, thinking, should I be wanted, it being time for my appearance as the Messiah I must not be delayed through having to bandage a number of sores. 
So he went to him and greeted him, saying, Peace upon thee, master and teacher. Peace upon thee, O son of Levi. He replied, When wilt thou come, master? asked he. Today, was his answer. On his returning to Elijah, the latter inquired, What did he say to thee? Peace upon thee, O son of Levi. He answered. Thereupon he Elijah observed. He thereby assured thee and thy father of a portion in the world to come. He spoke falsely to me. He rejoined. Stating that he would come today, but has not. He Elijah answered him. This is what he said to thee, today, if ye will hear his voice. Psalms 95. Topic. Rabbinic commentaries Topic. The medieval rabbinic figure Maimonides Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, also known as the Rambam, wrote a commentary to Tractate Sanhedrin stressing a relatively naturalistic interpretation of the Messiah and de-emphasizing miraculous elements. His commentary became widely although not universally, accepted in the non or less mystical branches of Orthodox Judaism. The Messianic Age is when the Jews will regain their independence and all return to the land of Israel. The Messiah will be a very great king, he will achieve great fame, and his reputation among the Gentile nations will be even greater than that of King Solomon. His great righteousness and the wonders that he will bring about will cause all peoples to make peace with him and all lands to serve him. Nothing will change in the Messianic Age, however, except that Jews will regain their independence. Rich and poor, strong and weak, will still exist. However it will be very easy for people to make a living, and with very little effort they will be able to accomplish very much. It will be a time when the number of wise men will increase. War shall not exist, and nation shall no longer lift up sword against nation. The messianic age will be highlighted by a community of the righteous and dominated by goodness and wisdom. It will be ruled by the Messiah, a righteous and honest king, outstanding in wisdom, and close to God. Do not think that the ways of the world or the laws of nature will change, this is not true. The world will continue as it is. The prophet Isaiah predicted, The wolf shall live with the sheep, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. This, however, is merely allegory, meaning that the Jews will live safely, even with the formerly wicked nations. All nations will return to the true religion and will no longer steal or oppress. Note that all prophecies regarding the Messiah are allegorical. Only in the Messianic age will we know the meaning of each allegory and what it comes to teach us. Our sages and prophets did not long for the Messianic age in order that they might rule the world and dominate the Gentiles, the only thing they wanted was to be free for Jews to involve themselves with the Torah and its wisdom. According to the Talmud, the Midrash, and the Kabbalistic work, the Zohar, the deadline, by which the Messiah must appear as 6,000 years from creation. Orthodox and Hasidic Jews believe that the Hebrew calendar dates back to the time of creation, the year 2009-2010 the Hebrew New Year begins during September or October of the Gregorian calendar corresponds to the Hebrew year 5770. There is a Kabbalistic tradition that maintains that the seven days of creation in Genesis chapter 1 correspond to seven millennia of the existence of natural creation. The tradition teaches that the seventh day of the week, Shabbat or the day of rest, corresponds to the seventh millennium Hebrew years 6000-7000, the age of universal rest, the messianic era. The Talmud comments, R. Katina said, 6,000 years the world will exist and 1,000, the seventh, it shall be desolate Haruv, as it is written, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day Isa, R. Katina also taught, just as the seventh year is the Shemitah year, so too does the world have 1,000 years out of seven that are fallow Mushmat, as it is written, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day Isa, and further it is written, a psalm and song for the Shabbat day Pease, 92 meaning the day that is altogether Shabbat, and also it is said, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past Pease, 90 Sanhedrin 97a, the Midrash comments. Six eons for going in and coming out, for war and peace. The seventh eon is entirely Shabbat and rest for life everlasting. The Zohar explains. The redemption of Israel will come about through the mystic force of the letter which has the numerical value of six, namely, in the sixth millennium. 
Happy are those who will be left alive at the end of the sixth millennium to enter the Shabbat, which is the seventh millennium, for that is a day set apart for the Holy One on which to effect the union of new souls with old souls in the world Zohar, Ve'era 119a. Elaborating on this theme are numerous early and late Jewish scholars, including the Ramban, Isaac Abrabanel, Abraham ibn Ezra, Rabinu Bachia, the Vilna Gaon, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Ramchal, Aryeh Kaplan, and Rebetzin Esther Jungres. <laughs> Orthodox Judaism the belief in a personal Messiah of the Davidic line is a universal tenet of faith among Orthodox Jews and one of Maimonides' thirteen principles of faith. Some authorities in Orthodox Judaism believe that this era will lead to supernatural events culminating in a bodily resurrection of the dead. Maimonides, on the other hand, holds that the events of the Messianic era are not specifically connected with the resurrection. See the Maimonides article. Conservative Judaism Topic. Conservative Judaism varies in its teachings. While it retains traditional references to a personal redeemer and prayers for the restoration of the Davidic line in the liturgy, conservative Jews are more inclined to accept the idea of a messianic era. We do not know when the Messiah will come, nor whether he will be a charismatic human figure or as a symbol of the redemption of mankind from the evils of the world. Through the doctrine of a messianic figure, Judaism teaches us that every individual human being must live as if he or she, individually, has the responsibility to bring about the messianic age. Beyond that, we echo the words of Maimonides based on the prophet Habakkuk 2 that though he may tarry, yet do we wait for him each day. Emmet Vayamuna, Statement of Principles of Conservative Judaism Topic. Reform Judaism Topic. Reform Judaism generally concurs with the more liberal conservative perspective of a future messianic era rather than a personal messiah. Topic. Gog and Magog Topic. According to some commentators, the war of Gog and Magog envisioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 is expected to occur in the end of days. This is described to be a climactic war that is said to occur at the end of the Jewish exile. Radek comments on Zechariah chapter 14, that in the end of days Jerusalem will be the battle ground of Gog and Magog. According to other commentators the long exile has already made up for it and it will no longer occur. The world to come the hereafter is known as Olam Haba, the world to come, Welm Heb in Hebrew, and related to concepts of Gan Eden, the heavenly garden in Eden, or paradise, and Gehinnom. The accepted halakha is that it is impossible for living human beings to know what the world to come is like, although Rav, a rabbi quoted in the Talmud, describes it thusly. In the world to come there is no eating, no drinking, no procreation, no business negotiations, no jealousy, no hatred, and no competition. Rather, the righteous sit with their crowns upon their heads, enjoying the splendor of the Divine Presence." The phrase Olam Haba does not occur in the Hebrew Bible. In the late Second Temple period, beliefs about the ultimate fate of the individual were diverse. The Essenes believed in the immortality of the soul, but the Pharisees and Sadducees, apparently, did not. The Dead Sea Scrolls, Jewish pseudepigrapha and Jewish magical papyri reflect this diversity. According to Maimonides, any non-Jew who lives according to the seven laws of Noah is regarded as a righteous Gentile, and is assured of a place in the world to come, the final reward of the righteous. Topic. Medieval rabbinical views. Topic. While all classic rabbinic sources discuss the afterlife, the classic medieval scholars dispute the nature of existence in the end of days after the messianic period. While Maimonides describes an entirely spiritual existence for souls, which he calls disembodied intellects, Nominides discusses an intensely spiritual existence on earth, where spirituality and physicality are merged. Both agree that life after death is as Maimonides describes the end of days, 
This existence entails an extremely heightened understanding of and connection to the Divine Presence. This view is shared by all classic rabbinic scholars. There is much rabbinic material on what happens to the soul of the deceased after death, what it experiences, and where it goes. At various points in the afterlife journey, the soul may encounter Hibbet ha Kever, the pains of the grave, Duma, the angel of silence, Satan as the angel of death, the Kaf ha Kila, the catapult of the soul, Gehinnom, purgatory, and Gan Eden, heaven or paradise. All classic rabbinic scholars agree that these concepts are beyond typical human understanding. Therefore, these ideas are expressed throughout rabbinic literature through many varied parables and analogies. Gehinnom is fairly well defined in rabbinic literature. It is sometimes translated as hell, but is much closer to the Catholic view of purgatory than to the Christian view of hell, which differs from the classical Jewish view. Rabbinic thought maintains that souls are not tortured in Gehinnom forever, the longest that one can be there is said to be eleven months, with the exception of heretics, and unobservant Jews. This is the reason that even when in mourning for near relatives, Jews will not recite mourners' Kaddish for longer than an eleven-month period. Gehinnom is considered a spiritual forge where the soul is purified for its eventual ascent to Gan Eden. Garden of Eden. In contemporary Judaism Topic. In explaining the orthodox view of the afterlife, Irving Greenberg, a modern orthodox rabbi, discussed both the world to come and the belief in punishment and reward in a moment magazine, Ask the Rabbis, forum. Belief in the afterlife, a world to come in which the righteous get their true reward and the wicked get their deserved comeuppance, is a central teaching of traditional Judaism. This belief stems from the conviction that a loving God would not allow injustice to win. When the facts of life did not fit the Bible's emphasis on reward and punishment in the here and now, this faith in the afterlife was emphasized. In the Middle Ages, when Jews suffered so much while enemies ruled the world, the stress on the world to come grew stronger. Some religious teachers taught that this life is unimportant, and that one should live only to be worthy of eternal bliss. This view spilled over into asceticism and less respect for the body and material activity. Early modernizers reversed direction. They validated Judaism and dismissed Christianity by insisting that Judaism is interested only in doing well in earthly life. Christianity was criticized as otherworldly, repressive and dreaming only of getting to heaven. It was described as cruel for condemning people to eternal damnation. This modern one-sided emphasis on mortal life robbed Jews of the profound consolation of eternal life and justice for all who suffered unjustly and innocently. What is needed is the classical Jewish ability to hold both sides of the tension. Such Judaism would inspire people to find God in the secular, to unite body and soul, to work for T.K. Kun Olam repairing the world in the here and now. At the same time, it would uphold the reality of the spirit and the immortality of the soul. This faith offers the consolation of a final reunion, with those we have loved and lost with the El Mala Rachamim, the infinite God of compassion. Conservative Judaism both affirms belief in the world beyond as referenced in the Amida and Maimonides' 13 precepts of faith while recognizing that human understanding is limited and we cannot know exactly what the world beyond consists of. Reform and Reconstructionist Judaism affirm belief in the afterlife, though they downplay the theological implications in favor of emphasizing the importance of the here and now, as opposed to reward and punishment. Topic. Resurrection of the dead Topic. The book of Ezekiel displays the first perception of resurrection. Under the Babylonian Empire in 539 BCE, Ezekiel described God's will to revive flesh upon the bones of dead Judeans. However, Ezekiel's narrative of resurrection was intended only as a metaphor for national rebirth, promising the Jews return to Israel and reconstruction of the temple. The book of Daniel promised literal resurrection to the Jews, in concrete detail. Daniel wrote that with the coming of the archangel Michael, misery would beset the world, and only those whose names were in a divine book would be resurrected. 
Moreover, Daniel's promise of resurrection was intended only for the most righteous and the most sinful because the afterlife was a place for the virtuous individuals to be rewarded and the sinful individuals to receive eternal punishment. Greek and Persian culture influenced Jewish sects to believe in an afterlife between the 6th and 4th centuries BCE as well. The Hebrew Bible, at least as seen through interpretation of Bavli Sanhedrin, contains frequent reference to resurrection of the dead. The Mishnah c. 200 lists belief in the resurrection of the dead as one of three essential beliefs necessary for a Jew to participate in it. All Israel have a portion in the world to come, for it is written, Thy people are all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. But the following have no portion therein, one who maintains that resurrection is not a biblical doctrine, the Torah was not divinely revealed, and an epikoros, heretic. In the late Second Temple period, the Pharisees believed in resurrection, while Essenes and Sadducees did not. During the Rabbinic period, beginning in the late 1st century and carrying on to the present, the works of Daniel were included into the Hebrew Bible, signaling the adoption of Jewish resurrection into the officially sacred texts. Jewish liturgy, most notably the Amidah, contains references to the tenet of the bodily resurrection of the dead. In contemporary Judaism, both Orthodox Judaism and Conservative Judaism maintain the traditional references to it in their liturgy. However, many conservative Jews interpret the tenet metaphorically rather than literally. Reform and Reconstructionist Judaism have altered traditional references to the resurrection of the dead in the liturgy, who gives life to the dead, to refer to who gives life to all. Topic: <inaudible> Reincarnation. Topic: the notion of reincarnation, while held as a mystical belief by some, is not an essential tenet of traditional Judaism. It is not mentioned in traditional classical sources such as the Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, the classical rabbinic works Mishnah and Talmud, or Maimonides' Thirteen Principles of Faith. While one might contend the idea of reincarnation is not outlined in the Tanakh, there exist references to resurrection throughout Isaiah. However, books of Kabbalah—Jewish mysticism— teach a belief in Gilgal, transmigration of souls, and hence the belief is universal in Hasidic Judaism, which regards the Kabbalah as sacred and authoritative. Among well-known rabbis who rejected the idea of reincarnation are Sadia Gaon, David Kimi, Hasdei Kreskas, Yediah Badershi early 14th century, Joseph Albo, Abraham Ibn Dodd and Leon de Modena. Among the Geonim, High Gaon argued with Sadia Gaon in favor of Gilgalim. Rabbis who accepted the idea of reincarnation include, from medieval times, the mystical leaders Namanides the Ramban and Rabbanu Baya ben Asher, from the 16th century, Levi ibn Habib the Ralba, and from the mystical school of Safed Shelomo Alkabez, Isaac Luria the Ari and his exponent Chaim Vital, and from the 18th century, the founder of Hasidism Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, later Hasidic masters, and the Lithuanian Jewish Orthodox leader and Kabbalist the Vilna Gaon. With the 16th century rational systemization of Cordovaran Kabbalah by the Ramak, and the subsequent new paradigm of Lurianic Kabbalah by the Ari, Kabbalah replaced Hakira, rationalistic medieval Jewish philosophy as the mainstream traditional Jewish theology, both in scholarly circles and in the popular imagination. Isaac Luria taught new explanations of the process of Gilgal, and identification of the reincarnations of historic Jewish figures, which were compiled by Chaim Vital in his Shar Hagelgulam. In Kabbalistic understanding of Gilgal, which differs from many Eastern religious views, reincarnation is not fatalistic or automatic, nor is it essentially a punishment of sin, or reward of virtue. In Judaism, the heavenly realms could fulfill Maimonides' principle of faith in reward and punishment. Rather, it is concerned with the process of individual tikkun rectification of the soul. In Kabbalistic interpretation, each Jewish soul is reincarnated enough times only in order to fulfill each of the 613 mitzvah. The souls of the righteous among the nations may be assisted through Gilgalim to fulfill their seven laws of Noah. As such Gilgal is an expression of divine compassion, and is seen as a heavenly agreement with the individual soul to descend again. This stress on physical performance and perfection of each mitzvah is tied to the Lurianic doctrine of cosmic tikkun of creation. In these new teachings, a cosmic catastrophe occurred at the beginning of creation called the shattering of the vessels of the Sephirot in the world of Tohu chaos. 
The vessels of the Sephirot broke and fell down through the spiritual worlds until they were embedded in our physical realm as sparks of holiness. Nitsutso. The reason in Lurianic Kabbalah that almost all mitzvah involve physical action is that through their performance, they elevate each particular spark of holiness associated with that commandment. Once all the sparks are redeemed to their spiritual source, the messianic era begins. This metaphysical theology gives cosmic significance to the life of each person, as each individual has particular tasks that only they can fulfill. Therefore, Gilgalim assist the individual soul in this cosmic plan. This also explains the Kabbalistic reason why the future eschatological utopia will be in this world, as only in the lowest, physical realm is the purpose of creation fulfilled. The idea of Gilgal became popular in folk belief, and is found in much Yiddish literature among Ashkenazi Jews. The Last Judgment in Judaism, the Day of Judgment happens every year on Rosh Hashanah, therefore, the belief in a last day of judgment for all mankind is disputed. Some rabbis hold that there will be such a day following the resurrection of the dead. Others hold that there is no need for that because of Rosh Hashanah. Yet others hold that this accounting and judgment happens when one dies. Other rabbis hold that the last judgment only applies to the Gentile nations and not the Jewish people. Topic Notes Topic Topic References Topic Topic External Links Topic The Origin of Jewish Eschatology by Nathaniel Schmidt the Kingdom of God in the Jewish Apocryphal Literature, by George Ladd, Gordon College